Good morning. We start with general questions and question number one from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what further consideration it has given to how it will address the affordability and accessibility of sanitary products. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, following a meeting on the 22nd of November last year, the Trussell Trust has agreed to gather data on people who access its network of food banks in Scotland requiring items such as sanitary products, soap, toothpaste and razors. And I'm happy to hear from other organisations that have evidence or experience to share. We continue to take action to support people in acute income crisis and address a poverty in all its forms. Since April 2013, our Scottish Welfare Fund has provided nearly 217,000 low-income households with community care grants and crisis grants. While our Fairer Scotland Action Plan sets out 50 actions we will take over the course of this Parliament to tackle the underlying causes. Monica Lennon. I thank the Minister for her answer and I welcome that update and the Trussell Trust have indeed been a uh, a very convincing advocate on this subject. Yesterday, I had the privilege of visiting South Lanarkshire College in East Kilbride, in the region that I represent, for the launch of their initiative to provide free access to sanitary products for all students and staff on their campus. I hope the Minister will agree with me about how important this initiative is and join me in congratulating South Lanarkshire College for showing leadership in delivering this lesson on how to end inequality as reported in today's daily record. Can the Minister tell me if the Government will consider looking further at the health importance of providing sanitary products, including in education settings where children and young people don't have access to their own incomes? Minister. I, I thank uh, Monica Lennon for, uh, again, with the tenacity of, of raising this issue and others across the Chamber who have a real commitment uh, to making a difference in this area. And, of course, we would like to put on record um, our... Um, Welcome to the work that South Lanarkshire Council are doing. I think it's important uh, work that they're doing. It's a positive message that they're sending out. And I think in relation to the subsequent uh, part of Monica Lennon's question, that there will be a great deal of learning about what they uh, find throughout their work, about how that can inform uh, any future work that we take forward around um, ensuring that uh, poverty, uh, period poverty uh, is is not as prevalent as it, as it is across our country. Uh, of course, my uh, officials are continuing to work with the Trussell Trust, so as long, as, alongside them agreeing to capture some of the data that they have from their food banks, my officials are working with them to help them understand that information as well. So I think there's a number of work streams in place there to make a difference, and we'll continue to work uh, across the parliamentary chamber to make a positive difference for women across the country. Question number two, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it the, encourages the enterprise agencies to consider alternative routes to superfast broadband in rural areas. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, the Scottish Government has set out a clear commitment to extend superfast broadband access to 100% of premises across Scotland by 2021, building on the success of our current fibre broadband investment programme. Uh, Highlands and Islands Enterprise has played a significant role in supporting the achievement of our commitment to provide broadband to 95% of premises by the end of 2017 uh, through, through Community Broadband Scotland and will continue to play a similar role in supporting delivery of the 2021 commitment. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In light of an article in the media yesterday where it was stated that some rural communities have already been told that they will not be included in the national rollout, can he reconfirm the Scottish Government's commitment to all premises in Scotland, including rural areas? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I think it's useful for me to clarify that uh, it is not the case, as was asserted by a Conservative MSP in a press release yesterday, that any community has been told that they will not be included in the commitment to universal access to broadband by 2021. And I, I'm not going to start off the year by making any party political points, because it's important to distinguish it's important to distinguish between delivery of the current contracts, uh, which will reach 95% of premises, uh, contracts were worth £400 million of investment, uh, and the second phase, presiding officer, uh, where we seek to roll out broadband access to all other businesses and people throughout the country. So I hope that that clarifies what is perhaps an understandable uh, uh, misappreciation of the facts. Jamie Green. 
Thank you for starting off, sir. Uh, I do thank the Cabinet Secretary for his update on that. However, uh, can he confirm that whether a real terms cut of 11% to the Highlands and Islands Enterprise uh, funding in the draft budget this year will uh, have any effect on their ability to be included in this last 5% of rollout? And actually, uh, looking at the draft budget, there doesn't seem to be any uh, lines in there for Community Broadband Scotland. So could he clarify the future of that uh, enterprise? Hey, well, I'll, I'll resist the, the temptation, strong though it is, to respond in a political fashion. Let's just stick to the facts, presiding officer. The HIE budget <laughs> is entirely separate from the broadband budget. It is totally different. It is unconnected to that. Uh, equally, it is wrong to assert that uh, community broadband has not got a budget. It has got an increase to its budget. And I'm happy to inform the, the member who sits on the REC, uh, where we had a very prolonged evidence session, as I recall, uh, that this year alone there will be 51 million in addition devoted to our commitment to roll out universal access to broadband by 2021. Presiding officer, those are the facts. Yeah, yeah. Grant. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, along with the current projects running out, uh, rolling out broadband um, to rural areas, there have been ones in the past, Pathfinder and the like, that are publicly funded. What is the Scottish Government doing to look at publicly funded fibre that is there already and utilising it to make sure that people get use of this as quickly as possible? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well, yes, we are working hard uh, to make sure that uh, uh, as many people as possible in rural communities and island communities get access to broadband. And there have been many successful schemes uh, uh, already. In fact, uh, I should say, in response to Ms. Ross, that in her constituency, 25,600 premises have been connected to the fibre network, with at least 20,000 of those able to achieve super fast speeds. And most of her constituents will be li living in, in a rural uh, uh, or uh, extremely remote locations. Uh, so, of course, we work with the private contractors, BT, in the case of the Highlands and Islands contract, uh, very closely. Uh, and I'm very pleased that, that Ofcom have recognized that the pace at which we are connecting people to, uh, to access to digital broadband uh, has been essentially twice as much as being achieved, twice as high as is being achieved in the rest of Scotland. So we are not complacent because those uh, who are listening to this who have not presiding officer got access will understandably want to have that as quickly as possible. But I can assure all members that this is a matter to which we're giving the utmost priority and action as well as an additional £51 million this year. Kate Forbes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. There are some community initiatives in rural areas like North Sky Broadband that are aiming to um, develop ultra-fast gigabit services to end the digital divide and future-proof digital infrastructure. Is the Scottish Government committed to supporting community broadband initiatives that are seeking to deliver that high-performance ultra-fast solution? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, yes, Kate Forbes has, has made me aware of community initiatives in uh, in her constituency, for example, North Sky Broadband, uh, uh, and they are aiming for gigabit services for residents on the island, and funding for Community Brand, uh, Broadband Scotland is being provided to work with communities who are developing their own broadband solutions. So this is not a case of one size or one technology fits all, presiding officer. It's an extremely complex, challenging task, but it's one that we are uh, entirely determined to achieve within the deadline set of 2021 because I think as the, the breadth of questions across the chamber illustrates, uh, this is really important to rural Scotland and to our island communities. I think every single member is aware of that and I want just to start the, the new year off by undertaking that we will do our level best working with members of all parties to achieve the targets as quickly as we possibly can. Question three, Marie Todd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I remind the Chamber that I am a pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council to ask the Scottish Government how it will take forward the recommendations of the review of access to new medicines? Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. <coughs> Dr Montgomery's independent review into medicines recognises that the Scottish Government has dramatically increased access to new medicines due to reforms and investment in recent years. 
The review makes a number of recommendations to build on that progress which we are taking forward in collaboration with our stakeholders. In addition to the recommendations in the review, we will also be making improvements to the individual patient treatment requests to further improve consistency and to ensure patients in Scotland get access to the right treatment at the right time. Monica, I, thank, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. I fear that while this review represents welcome progress for patients in terms of access to new medicines, the impact of our departure from the EU might result in a very large step backwards. If we look at the situation in Australia, which is a relatively small market with its own regulatory authority, there is usually a lag time for access to new medicines compared to the US and the EU. In this time, individual patients are left to import and pay for their own medicines from abroad. Can the Minister give any assurances that our place within the European Medicines Authority and thus our access to new medicines is secure? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Marie Todd is, is quite right to raise this as yet another issue of concern raised by the prospect of Brexit. Uh, regulation for the licensing, safety and efficacy of medicines is currently reserved to the UK Government and is the responsibility of the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, who operate on a UK-wide basis. MHRA have assured us that the UK Government is aware of the need to ensure that medicines licensed through the European Medicines Agency remain approved for use across the UK uh, after exit from the European Union. They have said this is not an issue which needs to form part of any negotiation, but be, will be within the UK's own competence. However, it is an issue of concern, as Marie Todd has highlighted, and I would be happy to keep uh, Marie Todd informed of this issue as it is taken forward. Anasawa. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome Dr Montgomery's report, which does recognise there is also a lot more work uh, to do. Can the Cabinet Secretary give a guarantee that the new arrangements around new medicines will guarantee that no one and there is no postcode lottery for any patient right across the whole of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as uh, Anna, Sarwell will, Anna Sarwell will be aware, uh, there have already been um, major improvements made to access to medicines. Um, the approval rates via IPCR have improved from 69% in 2012-13 to 87% last year for all medicines and from 45% to 85% for end-of-life orphan and ultra-orphan medicines. However, as I said in my original answer, there is more uh, to do, um, and that's why uh, the, uh, the replacement of the IPTR with a uh, Tier 2 of PACS introduces a national appeals panel, which will bring consistency to access across Scotland, uh, and a principle of access to medicines uh, available elsewhere in the UK will be a material part of consideration through PACS. So a lot of progress has been done, but these recommendations will uh, make sure that there is uh, further equity and fairness across the system. I'm sure that's someone that every, something that everyone will welcome. And Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, what progress is there on the sharing of information moving to electronic patient health records, which has been called for by the health pro professionals in their response to the new digital strategy proposals and is recommended to be prioritised in the Montgomery report? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, a, a new digital health and care strategy from 2017 to 22 is being developed. Uh, views of a wide range of stakeholders are currently being sought. We already have significant electronic patient records for, uh, for example, the emergency care summary, which has details of patients' medicine and any allergies, which is shared between clinicians in hospital and GPs on a, a regular basis. Additionally, uh, HEPMA, the Hospital Electronic Prescribing Medicines Administration, is being rolled out across Scotland. I also announced on the 14th of December that we'll be taking forward the recommendations of the Montgomery Review in collaboration with our stakeholders and we'll work to implement these as quickly as possible. Question number four, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the implementation of its equally safe strategy. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Uh, yes, an update on implementation will be provided uh, alongside the draft delivery plan for Equally Safe, which will be published for consultation in the coming weeks. Ruth Maguire. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The 2014 Equally Safe Strategy designates commercial sexual exploitation, such as prostitution, as a form of violence against women. Different forms of violence against women will demand different and specific interventions. I understand from the strategy that joint working is required to reduce the demand for commercial sexual exploitation. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on how that joint working to reduce demand had progressed? Cabinet Secretary. Um, Ms McGuire's analysis of the situation very much uh, conforms uh, to the government's view. Equally Safe makes clear that our definition uh, of violence against women and girls includes behaviour uh, that stems from systemic, uh, deep-rooted women's inequality, such as uh, commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, we also believe that policy decisions on the issue uh, of prostitution should be evidence-based. Uh, that's why we commissioned research to consider uh, the reliability of evidence-based international so we can understand its relevance uh, to Scotland. Uh, that research will be published shortly and there will be an opportunity for uh, stakeholders uh, to comment on the findings uh, on that uh, research and to have a, a meaningful dialogue with the government about it. In the meantime, uh, as a government, we will continue to support measures uh, that can help to reduce the harm caused by prostitution and encourage, uh, of course, enforcement of existing laws uh, against those who exploit others uh, through prostitution. And in terms of various uh, initiatives to tackle uh, commercial sexual exploitation, an example um, of joint working would be the support that we give to the Women's Support Project uh, to challenge demand for commercial sex uh, and also the funding that we give to SACRO uh, for their Another Way service, uh, which offers uh, non-judgmental uh, one to one support for women at risk of or involved in prostitution or other forms of commercial sexual exploitation. Question number five, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet with Fife Council. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of all Scottish local authorities, including Fife Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. The Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills met representatives of Fife Council on the 20th of December to discuss a number of issues relating to education. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Leavenmouth is the largest urban area in Scotland not currently served by rail. Can the Minister provide my constituents with an assurance today that Transport Scotland will work with Fife Council to provide the much needed clarity and guidance which is required in order to re-establish this vital rail link? Yes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I understand that uh, Transport Scotland have now received a revised version uh, of the Leave and Mouth Sustainable Transport Study from Fife Sco Sco uh, Council. Transport Scotland officials will consider that study uh, and provide further com comments once they have they had the opportunity uh, to consider uh, that in more detail. Alec Rowley. I thank you, President Officer. I, I certainly would um, support Jenny Gilruth in, in raising this question today. Not only is Leavemouth not served by rail, but it's the highest area of deprivation in Fife. Will he ensure that we have joined up government for the different parts of the Scottish Government to try and actually push and make this rail link happen? Because it would be a, a great advantage to tackling the inequality and poverty in that part of Fife. Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Of course, uh, the government works in a, a, a joined-up manner, and I'm sure that the Transport Minister uh, will have heard uh, what Mr Rowley has uh, said here today. Uh, as I said to Ms Gilruth, uh, that study, the Leave and Mouth Sustainable Transport Study, is now with Transport Scotland. Uh, they will comment, and I'm quite sure that the Transport Minister will take a great interest in what they have to say. Question number six, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, President Officer. To ask the Scottish gov Government what allocation of its budget has been given to local government for capital spending. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. I can confirm that the total local government capital funding allocation for 2017 18 will amount to £756.5 million. This represents an increase of almost £150 million, or nearly 25% as compared with 2016 17. Patterson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Recent reports that schools down south built using PFI PP contracts are being ripped off through the cost of teaching supplies as these supplies form part of the PP 
PPI PFI uh, agreement. Can I ask the Scottish Government if any schools in Scotland built using PP, PFI PPP are in a similar position to, uh, to that and what cost? Secretary. I can confirm that none of the standard contracts previously used for schools PFI PPP deals included the cost of school teaching supplies.